Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed day of the world, Lord to everyone. This is the King Scott Bible teaching, prayer, and leadership development service. Today we'll be dedicated to praying for Nigeria, the nation of Nigeria, uh, that is actually coming to uh, an election. It's actually in an election season uh, that's going to happen this Saturday, 25th of uh, February. Uh, you know, for various reasons, Nigeria requires a lot of prayers right now. And I would enjoin everyone who is a lover of peace, wherever, you know, people may be, <clears throat> you know, to pray for Nigeria. Nigeria is very significant. Uh, probably can go into a, a lot of details on that. But, you know, for those who might think, oh, it doesn't, it, it, you know, it's not your business, doesn't matter to you. Well, think again, because God forbid if, what is happening, for instance, in Ukraine happens like in Nigeria, the effect to the world would be probably four times bigger than you have in Ukraine. Uh, just for the sheer fact that you're talking about a nation of over 200 million people. So can you imagine 200 million people running away for their lives? Uh, that's gonna be a flooding of the nations, America, Europe, whatever. You don't want that. So. It is in the best interest of the nations of the world, the world at large, that Nigeria, you know, gets it right, that is peaceful. Um, you know, it, it could just be devastating, but we're going to pray. And uh, the theme of this whole prayer really is for Nigerians and especially the young ones to understand, the younger generation, the generation that is coming of, that has come of age, actually, to understand that what's going on here is a struggle, uh, what some people might call birth pangs. You know, when, when it's time to give birth to something new, there's that pain, there's that tussle, there's that struggle, there is that, you know, push and all of that that is required. And so the nation is on the verge of breaking forth into a new thing. But of course, like you would expect, the hold is the old weather is still holding on and the old would not let go without a fight. And when I say fight, because I'm going to be using that term, please, I'm not talking about physical violence. I'm not talking about physical fight. I'm talking about spiritual warfare. I'm talking about legal processes. I'm talking about, you know, an insistence on what is right and a push that is required to bring forth the new nation of Nigeria. But we're going to start off with... Uh, what I would call the national anthem of Nigeria, I would say that because some people would say it's not the official anthem of Nigeria. And again, it goes back to the tussle between the old and the new. There is an official uh, anthem of Nigeria, which for those who know it speaks primarily of the past. Uh, maybe I'm just gonna go ahead and say the words so that uh, our viewers who are not familiar with it will understand. But the, what we're gonna play will be the the new something, a new anthem that was developed not too long ago, uh, which actually is more futuristic, is a vision. And in fact, if you will permit me, I would say no nation on planet Earth has a national anthem, speaking of the new one, as spiritual as this one. So why would it not be adopted as the as the um, as the uh, nation's uh, official anthem? Well, again, it goes back to the struggle. But the old anthem talks about <clears throat> the compatriots, just as arise, O oh, compatriots, Nigeria's call, obey, to serve our fatherland with love and strength and faith, right? To, to, you know, to, to, to serve Nigeria with all our might and all of that stuff. The labors of the heroes past will not be in vain. You know, one nation bound in freedom, peace, and unity. Beautiful but speaks about a nation that is coming off, you know, coming out of uh, colonization and coming into uh, becoming a nation, into sovereignty, speaking about the labors of the heroes who fought for uh, the, 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 the independence of the nation and so on and so forth. A nation bound, you know, by freedom. So it's talking about fight for freedom. But when you hear the, the next, uh, the new anthem, 
you're going to see how visionary that is. You're going to see how that is a prayer. And you're going to see how that speaks about a future that Nigerians can look forward to. So we're going to play it. It's rendered by an uprising artist in Nigeria as well, uh, a Marvel job. So we're going to start off with that, and then we'll go into the message proper. Again, I want to welcome you to this uh, session of prayers. Amen. We pray for Nigeria. Yeah. Oh, God of creation. Direct our noble cause. Guide our prophesy even according to the rendition of this anthem rise up nigeria and fulfill your destiny rise up rise up nigeria in the name of the lord jesus and so lord we give you praise even as we go into these prayers for nigeria holy spirit you are the leader you are the guide you're the helper without you we can do absolutely nothing so we welcome you holy spirit take the stage uh guide lead glorify Jesus. And for that, we say amen and amen and amen. Personally, I have been, you know, tried, well, maybe I've, I, I haven't been 100% silent, but I've tried to be silent and to not get involved with public discourse uh, regarding the politics of Nigeria, at least in the last few months. And, you know, just stayed away because, I mean, I could get passionate about this thing and, um, sometimes can get you into trouble too, but I stayed away. But, you know, in the last few days, of course, a lot of prophets, and by the way, let me also say to those who might say, oh, you know, God is not speaking. No, God is speaking. God is speaking about the nation, and my, my apologies to those who no longer want to hear from prophets. Maybe you can point to examples or reasons why you don't want to. Well, that's your position, but the truth of the matter is God is the God of the nations, and he does speak. The question is, those who are looking for the voice of God or wanting to know the will of God, what direction are you looking at? You know, in what direction are you looking at? So yeah, you might say, but the ministers are not uniform in their uh, message. That is true also. But don't forget also, even a prophetic message or a supposed word of God could be tainted with a number of things, including nationalism, personal or individual preferences and all of that. So you have all of that going on, but even in the midst of all of that, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the multitude of sounds and, and words and utterances, there are, there are those that are truly genuine coming from the spirit of God. Now, let me quickly say also that when you're speaking about the prophetic, the prophetic is not to appeal to the wishes and the caprices of people. It's like, you know, just tickle our fancy, tell us what's going to happen. That's really not what it's about. Uh, if you go back to the Bible uh, in uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 3, the Lord God declared Ezekiel to be a watchman. He said, today I've made you a watchman, son of man, over your nation. Now it shows you a God who cares about a nation. It shows you a God who raises up people from within the nation to be watchmen over their nations. 
And the Lord said, you are, so, you are supposed to assume a posture, the posture of a watchman, and to indeed watch and see what's going on. And whatever you see, of course, you judge from my perspective. When you do see danger coming forth, I need you to open your mouth and warn the people and let them know danger is coming. And but, but observe, even though the watchman sees the danger coming and warns the people, the watchman has no power to actually make the people follow the word of the Lord. It is still the choice of the people to do what God has said. Now, again, you're going to have uh, uh, um, a division. You're going to have some people going in this direction and some other people going in a different direction. It's always the case. But understand the place of the prophetic, the place of the watchman is to see and to discern and then judge accurately from divine perspective. What people make do with that information is totally up to them. As a matter of fact, in cases like Jeremiah, Jeremiah warned about the coming onslaught of Babylon and warned the people, don't go this direction. You go this direction, it, this is what's going to happen. But they didn't obey the word of the Lord. And so when captivity came, everybody was taken. And guess what? Jeremiah was taken also into captivity. So a prophet of the prophets can see and warn and yet become a part of the enslavement, a part of the captivity, a part of the undesirable outcome, just because the people didn't listen or follow the word of God. And that is something very, very critical. So I want to lay that, you know, uh, um, uh, right up front. So you're not come in expecting, oh, he's going to tell us who's going to be president. That's not my job. It's called a democracy. It's called a democracy for a reason. It's a democracy where people decide who they want, right? So it's not a place or the place of the ministers of God or the watchmen or the prophets to say this is who it's going to be. I mean, you could say that, but again, it doesn't have to be because we've seen cases where God says, do this. And the people say, no, we're going this direction. So people can say no to God, and people need to understand that. Prophets need to know that. Samuel was really displeased when Israel turned uh, against the counsel of the Lord. And God said, Samuel, don't be offended. It's me they rejected, not you, right? And so prophecy should also be offended when people do not follow the word of God. Our place, of course, is to continue to pray, continue to seek the best outcomes, even in the midst of, you know, the worst because we've seen terrible things happen in the past and God has gotten glory out of that. I mean, the worst case scenario was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. You would think that was the end of the story, but out of death came life, out of death came resurrection. So God is not limited by the extremes that people try to put on God, doesn't happen. You know, so, you know, that idea or posture of, if it's not this, then the world has come to an end, please listen. That is not true. The war doesn't come to an end. A nation doesn't come to an end except by the word of the Lord. It is the Lord who by his word cast the beginning or cast the formation of these things. He alone can bring an end to a thing. All right. It is by his, by his mercies that we're not consumed. So Nigerians, I want you to allay your fears and be relaxed even as you go into this situation, as you go into this period. It's not a do or die affair. And I'm going to say when I come to the council, young men, young people, please don't die for this. Please don't die for this. Don't kill yourself for this. If you don't get it today, tomorrow is another day. But understand that Nigeria has come into a prophetic season of needed change, a prophetic season where a generation has come of age and is desiring to come into the place of critical decision-making for their future. That is where Nigeria is at right now. But the old is still fighting, the old guard, the old brigade is still holding on. And power is not given, power is taken, you already know that. But understand, in the realm of the spirit, there's a shift. Now, whether it happens now or not is not my issue. My issue is that that season is now. There's a call, there's a cry for change. A generation has come of age and is agitating for change, agitating for things to be done differently, agitating for, you know, the past practices that have not helped anyone to be done away with. Some of these people have been exposed to different parts of the world and have seen how the world rose. And they are saying, why can't our nation be like that as well? So there's this agitation of the masses of a generation that has come of age. But again, the old God is there. All right, we're going to proceed with that for time's sake. 
So as I began to meditate over these things and just yield myself to the spirit, okay, Lord, you know, I, prayer, we have to pray. You were called to pray for the nations, right? And my house should be a house of prayer for the nations. And so, okay, what are we praying? We don't just want to open our mouths and pray. And I'm sorry, a lot of people do that. But, you know, prayer is not just about you saying what you want. It's not just about you telling God what to do. That's not prayer. Prayer is finding out what is the will of God. Prayer is finding out, Holy Spirit, is there something you want to reveal? Is there something you want to make known? Is there something you would like us to focus on? And so that was my posture. And saints of God, as I started doing that, the Holy Spirit brought to my attention the Nigerian coat of arms. Haven't heard anybody talk about it from this perspective. Haven't heard anybody, not in recent times, but the Lord began to, the Holy Spirit began to focus or draw, drew my attention to the Nigerian coat of arms. Like, okay, where are we going with this? What's going to, what's, what are you about to reveal? What are you about to say? So that's where I'm going to be taking my, the, the message from, the Nigerian coat of arms. So before we go into talking about the Nigerian coat of arms, let's look at the history of coats or shields of arms. So it's also called shield of arms. When you look at Britannica.com, it begins to tell us that a coat of arms is a heraldic device dating to sometime around the 12th century in Europe. So it's something that originated from Europe, not to say other nations didn't have heraldic artifacts or heraldic practices. They did, because don't forget, if you are a kingdom, then you are dealing with kings. If you're dealing with kings, then there's that heraldic, you know, a, a, a posture and heraldic, you know, a, a, a ceremony that goes with the kingship and all of that. And the Europeans truly had a lot of kings and so on in many of the nations. So it came with that. But when it comes to a coat of arms, it, it was the Europeans who came up with that. For instance, the Jews have their heraldic thing, talk about Jesus being described as a lion of the tribe of Judah and so on and so forth. Even in Nigeria, we have praises to our kings. We give, we, we come up with titles and we, oh my God, it's a beautiful thing when you observe it. You know, they give titles to the king, they praise him and they talk about his strength and his might. They compare him to the gods and all of that stuff. So heraldic things were popular already. But it was the Europeans who came up with making it a, a coat of arms or a shield of arms, just about the 12th century, all right? Now, later on, it became, it was adopted by, as emblems for, you know, schools, churches, guilds, corporations, but watch this, to reflect their origin or their history. That is the goal. The goal is that a coat of arms, a shield of arms was to bear a message. It was to reflect the origin of the nation, the origin of the entity or the organization or the corporation, but also tells a story. It brings about, it tells the story of the history of that organization. For them, in many cases, it was conquest at war. Of course, you know about this time, uh, Europe, Europe was going around for global conquest, conquering various nations all over the world. Out of this came colonization, all right? So their shield or their coat of arms told the story of their conquest. All right, let's move on. Now, coming to the Nigerian coat of arms, the question then arises, who designed the Nigerian coat of arms? There's a lot of debate on that. But there is this article by the independent.ng, ng standing for Nigeria, but which points to a, a, a one Raphael James. Raphael James at the time was the director general of the Center for Research, Information, and Media Development in Lagos, Nigeria. So he went into this research to find out, you know, from the history and from the archives, who exactly designed the coat of arms for Nigeria. And during the 60th anniversary of Nigeria, which was in 2020, he came up you know, with, with the discovery and in, in the footnote or the closing remark, he says, today we are happy to announce to Nigerians that in collaboration with our United Kingdom representative, Mr. John Redhead, we have unraveled who designed the coat of arms and it, it, it points that it was Messrs. Beverly Peak Associates 
of London that they was the ones they were the ones who designed the Nigerian coat of arms. So now there's a lot of debate, like I said earlier, but this comes very close. I mean, he gives a lot of uh, uh, history points, even to documents, even Nigerian documents, letters written, and all of that, even the story behind the whole thing. So just as uh, 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 you know, independence was coming. You know, the, the, the contract was given to this organization, to this vendor, and they drafted the first coat of arms, and it was ready just about 14 days to the day of independence, which was October 1st, 1960. So it was drafted. They agreed, oh, we, we can make improvements later on, but they were the original ones. And then going back in history, you can prove these things. In this picture, we have, uh, if you look at the far, uh, uh, far right, there's the Al Haji Sa Ahmadu Bello. Ahmadu Bello was the Sadona, in other words, the Sultan of Sokoto, Sokoto being a state in Nigeria, all right? One time a prominent Northern state. But the Sadona or the Sultan of Sokoto was the leader of Nigeria's Northern region, all right? Next to him was Gen, uh, the governor general of Nigeria. This is the, the British governor general who was like, if you will, the president of Nigeria. In fact, it was the last British ruler of Nigeria before handing over to a Nigerian prime minister. And that is James Wilson Robertson, all right? So he was the last colonial proconsul over Nigeria. Next to him is another leader from Nigeria, Chief Obafemi Awolowo, he, be, he, he turned out to be the leader of the Southwestern region for those who say the, Yor the Yoruba land. So he became the leader of the Yoruba land. Uh, Sadona of Sokoto became the leader of the Northern Empire, the Northern people, all right? And the Northern people were made up of various tribes called the Aousas. And then there was this other ethnic group known as the Fulanis. So they were all combined as the North. Next to our Chief Awolowo, is, which is in the far left, is Dr. Nnamdi Azikiwe, who turned out to be the leader of the Southeastern region, or for those who understand the tribe, the Igbo tribe, which is also where I'm from myself. So he became the leader of the Igbo tribe, Chief Awolowo became the leader of the Yoruba tribe, and the Sadana became the leader of the Northern tribes, or ethnic you know, uh, groups. Okay, so, but these three had to come together in agreement for the nation to move forward. And right there was the governor negotiating and all of that. Now, it also helps for us to understand that at this time, the prime minister of uh, Britain was prime minister Harold Macmillan. Very interesting story. Harold Macmillan became uh, prime minister of uh, 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 Britain sometime around 1953, 1956, thereabout. But when he came, he came with an ideology of decolonization. And by the way, it was of a conservative party, something to think about, a conservative party talking about letting go the colonies. So he brought up the idea of decolonization. He was attacked for it. I mean, all kinds of things happened. But at this time, he traveled through Africa. Nigeria, Ghana ended, I think, somewhere in South Africa. This is when he came to Nigeria in January 1960. And you can see him there meeting the man who eventually became the first prime minister of Nigeria, the first Nigerian prime minister, and that is Alahaji Tafawa Balewa, all right? And on the other side, you can see uh, 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 the Governor General Robertson over there. So all these negotiations were going on, all right? So again, all this were because uh, 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 Prime Minister Harold Macmillan was really pushing for the decolonization decolonization of the nations, for, for Britain to let go of these nations, even though it was for uh, business purposes and all of, all of that, but it, it, it's important for us to remember that God was orchestrating things in the background. The next picture, of course, was the D-Day of the uh, independence. So in this photo, you have Britain's Princess Alexandra of Kent. She is the one in the middle. All right, she was, she's posing with Nigeria's federal prime minister. So by now he had become prime minister, Alahaji Sa Abubakar Tafawa Balewa. And of course, on their right, or to the, their left, my right, is again the governor general, uh, uh, Robertson, you know, who was negotiating all of this. All right, and this was in October 1960. 
of course, uh, uh, Princess Alexandra represented the Queen Elizabeth. All right, so why did I go into all of that? Just to let you know that some things were happening in the background and the British were really pushing for that. In fact, the Americans came against it. Why are you leaving that early and so on and so forth? Are they ready to govern themselves? Have they been equipped and so on and so forth? Not gonna go into all of those histories today. But let's get back to the coat of arms. So the coat of arms, Messieurs, uh, uh, the guys who, who set this up, this, you know, began to give an example, uh, I mean, explanation of what they designed in the coat of arms. So where am I going with this sense of God? The coat of arms was designed by non-Nigerians. They were designed by, if you will, the colonial masters, the colonialists. They were designed by people who were not from the place, but they had vision. They, this was them, don't forget, she, the coat of arms tells a story. The coat of arms tells an origin. The coat of arms, it's, a, it's like casting a vision. So that's what the Holy Spirit was bringing to my mind, that in your coat of arms, O Nigeria, is a vision that the Lord has cast already for you. Put it in the heart of these people. You know, you may not like it, but again, hey, but they put it in the coat of arms. So within your coat of arms, O Nigeria, is a vision that the Lord is calling you to at this point in time. And we're going to go into, get into it. So the, the vendor, the organization, the, you know, the company, began to explain what the coat of what they meant by the coat of arms. So they, first of all, they said the black shield represents Nigeria's fertile soil. All right. I would say represents the people too, because after all, Nigeria is the most populous black nation on the face of the earth. Nowhere do you have the congregation of black people more than you have in Nigeria. Nigeria has that. All right. So the black shield, they said, represents the fertile soil. All right. The wavy pearl, you know, in the middle, looking like a Y, they said symbolizes the meeting of the two major rivers in West Africa. So again, please go, go to the background and see what's going on here. This is a people who have done their survey. This is a people who have done a, a mapping of the place. This is a bit, now I'm, I'm sorry not to be insulting or anything. You know, this tribes were there. Ethnic groups were all over the place. In fact, we have documents that show that certain ethnic groups migrated to Nigeria as early as the, the 10th century. That is 11 something, that far. So some ethnic groups had stayed in that land that is now called Nigeria or portions of that land for hundreds of years. All right, many other ethnic groups came from here and there. And so it's a multi-ethnic uh, 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 geographical location, but none of them had studied all of these things. None of them had come to know what this land entails. None of them had come to know the beauty of the land. What is in the land? It was the foreigners who came and did it because don't forget, colonialism was going on at this time. But these guys took a time to survey the land. And that is something not to forget, Nigeria. Oh my Lord, I pray we understand the things that should unite us rather than divide us, okay? So they said that that represents the coming together of the two uh, uh, most significant rivers in West Africa, the River Niger, and the river Benue, two major rivers, they come together in a place called Lokoja. And Lokoja you find in Kogi State. Kogi State is a state in Nigeria. As a matter of fact, it, where they, the confluence of the two rivers, they don't meet, just like in South Africa, where the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean come together, but they don't mix. Also, you have it here, river Niger, river Benue do not mix, but they come together in Lokoja. And somebody had said that that was God's signature upon the nation because it looks like a Y, which you could say is Yahweh. Okay, that's good. All right. But just to show you how significant this is, here is a cropped map. In this cropped map, you can see clearly Nigeria. Uh, th that's Nigeria right there. This is Nigeria. And observe what's going on here. This is the Atlantic Ocean. This the, the whole blue around here is at the Atlantic Ocean. You have all of these nations that border the Atlantic Ocean, all the way from Senegal, speaking of West Africa, all the way from Senegal, all the way going even to Cameroon and so on and so forth. But interestingly, none of them has 
an opening or a break in a natural uh, opening for the Atlantic Ocean to flow into their nation like it did in Nigeria. So the Atlantic Ocean in the south side of Nigeria found a natural opening and not only a natural opening, but actually paved the way through natural processes. This was not man-made, natural processes and went all the way going, uh, going uh, north, uh, north, north of Nigeria. And so got to this area in Lokoja and then parted for some reason, parted and to the right you have River Benue. So this is River Benue going this direction and terminated in Cameroon. Okay, but then look at River Niger. River Niger continues going further northwest. All right, going northwest and goes past Nigeria, touches Bene, Repo Bene Republic, which is a, a nation bordering Nigeria, goes from there and crosses Niger. Niger is just above Nigeria and goes from there, touches Mali, which is another nation, and then curves down and comes to Guinea. And in fact, touches Sierra Leone as well and then terminates there, not even breaking back into the Atlantic Ocean. You begin to wonder what's going on here. And don't you see how strategic that is? So by, for those who have been following us, we've talked about special factors. This is a special factor. Special factors define realms. Special factors can you know, determine the economic strength of a nation, of a geographical region, of a realm. So this particular natural uh, 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 structure or natural, you know, a uh, uh, pathway has become one of the things that has elevated Nigeria to its status of economic giant in all of West Africa. Powerful. You need to know these things. And these guys captured it and they put it in the coat of arms. Let's proceed. They now went on in the coat of arms to say that the two supporting horses or chargers on each side represented dignity. Now it's important to remember, Nigeria is not a nation known for horses. Again, don't forget, it was the Europeans who did this, all right? It wasn't Nigerians who, if Nigerians had done the coat of arms, they probably would have used cows or cattle because that's what we have in Nigeria or goats or rams, all right? We have those in Nigeria, but you don't have horses that much. If you have horses, they were imported. At the time of, you know, all of this happening, we're talking about just coming out of the Second World War, the nations that dealt with horses were the likes of Germany, you know, the, the, the Sp Spain, you know, Russia, those were the ones who dealt in horses. But here comes these people casting a vision of horses for Nigeria, which you don't have horses, you're not a nation known for horses. But they said, no, we find strength in Nigeria likened to the strength of a horse, likened to the strength of chargers, likened to the strength of these white horses. Oh my God, that's powerful. That's the Lord speaking to you, Nigeria. The Lord sees you as a nation of strength, a nation of people who are strength, who, are, who, can, who can labor with their hands. You got strengths. And that vision was cast in your coat of arms. And then they went on, and this is interesting. I'm gonna come back to this. They talked about the eagle. And by the way, Nigeria is not known to be a nation about eagles. You may have eagles come in and go out, but Nigeria is not known to be an eagle, you know, community, an eagle uh, uh, location. That, not so much. But then they said, no, we see something about you, Nigeria. The eagle, they said, represents strength. But interestingly, they stopped at that. And that's where the Holy Spirit focused on. And I'm going to come back to that, but let's proceed. Then they talked about the red flowers. The red flowers is the Custos spectabilis, which you see all over the place in Nigeria, in Sierra Leone, actually all over West Africa. This particular plant uh, is, is abundant. So they picked it up as, and, and made it the national flower, the national symbol of the nation, representing the beauty of the nation. Okay, but then they went on the green and white twist of the toss, that is the reef, the reef upon which the eagle is standing. They said that represents also uh, the richness, excuse me, the richness of the soil. All right, and then they went on to talk about the banderole. The banderole is the, 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 the thing at the, at the bottom there, you know, and, and then they said that is, uh, uh, you know, they put the words there. Actually, when they did it originally, it was unity and faith. They stopped at unity and faith. But then one of the presidents of Nigeria 
uh, Al Haji Shehu Shagari around 1978 added peace and progress to it. So not just unity and faith, but also peace and progress. Now, before I move away from this, let me quickly say to especially young people who say things like, is it only prayer, prayer, prayer? Nigeria, Nigeria, you pray too much. You, is, is it prayer we will eat? Let's do, please stop saying that. If you're a child of God, stop saying that. Because buried, engraved in your own foundation, which is shown by your coat of arms, is the very theme of faith. The leaders, the colonialists found that. Why did they do that? Why did they say that? Could it be that God is defining your destiny? Could it be that God is defining your identity in Nigeria to let you know there is tremendous faith in you? As I speak today, apart from the United States, Nigeria is the next nation when it comes to the Christian faith. Talk about the vigor, talk about the passion, talk about the Talk about the the, the, the the fervency of faith. Talk about the the, the, the corners. I, I mean, the, the, the revelation of the word of God. After America is Nigeria. In fact, there is, there, is a, there is debate whether America is even better than Nigeria when it comes to the revelation of the word. Nigeria has that. Faith is in your foundation, Nigeria. So stop, stop trying to be like South Africa. Stop trying to be like America. Stop trying to be like Singapore and China and all of these places. You are unique. There is an identity that the Lord has carved out for you. And one of it is faith. And it's in that identity that you will find your peace and you find your progress. Oh, by the way, how about Islam? Remove uh, Saudi Arabia. Remove the likes of probably Iran. Now, even Iran's Islam, Islam is not, the, I mean, it's an oppressive type. But remove Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, remove places like uh, Indonesia. Nigeria is one of the top Islamic nations. Can you imagine that? Oh, how about you want to go in, uh, into a... Uh, idol worship oh my lord talk about idol worship talk about demonic stuff nigeria is top, one of the top nations when it comes to that so in every area when you look at it is it christianity nigeria is is doing very well is that, is that one of the top nations is it in islam nigeria is one of the top nations is it even in idol worship and satan worship nigeria is at the top I mean, mighty things have come out of nigeria from all sides why? Because faith is embedded in your foundation. And the earlier you embrace it, the better for you. Out of this nation, God has raised up mighty ministers of God who have traversed the earth, declaring the power of God, declaring the deeds of God with mighty signs and wonders. No need to mention names. And even as I speak, many of them are still there right now. So please... Don't shy away from your foundation. Don't shy away from your spiritual identity because in your foundation and in your spiritual identity, God has embedded faith. That is why God has raised up mighty men of, of, of God and women of God out of Nigeria who are affecting nations. In fact, all of Africa looks up to Nigeria when it comes to these things. Not just the economy, not just development, but also understand what makes for your peace. Make understand what makes for your success. It is unity. The next thing I want to talk about, God designed it that way. There are some people who say, well, the multicultural or multi-ethnic uh, and diversity of Nigeria is what is the problem. No, sir, it's not. God ordained it that way. They will say, oh, Russia are Russian. We, even though that's not true, you have Oigo Muslims and all sorts of people in Russia, but that's fine. China, you have different people, you know, of the Chinese. But some people think, oh, if we are one nation, if the Igbos go in one direction, the Yorubas go in one direction, the Northerners go in one direction, then we'll be fine. I say to you, God did not ordain it that way. Unity is in your foundation. God is using Nigeria to showcase the unity in diversity of a multi-ethnic nation. Please understand that. You are meant to be one. You are meant to be together. God designed it that way. Don't forget what I said earlier. Many of these ethnic uh, groups came, migrated to the place hundreds of years, going all the way back to like 1103. Can you imagine that? You've been there since 1103, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, then 19. Before you talk about Nigeria as a nation or independence, 
But why did these nations migrate to this place? Because God orchestrated it. So Nigeria, please understand, there is unity in your diversity. There is strength in your diversity. God has called you to be one. And by the way, the fight between Christians and Islam should not be because in essence, both of you came from the same father, Abraham. You both came from the same father, Abraham. So you can cohabit. You can coexist. The idea of, oh, Islamization, Fulanization, please stop. Let there be peace. Let there be unity. Let there be strength in diversity. Common sense, wisdom. That's where you now find progress. So your, prog your progress is the last thing. First and foremost is your unity. If you're united and recognize that you're a nation of faith, you are a nation that should be a voice to the nations of the world. Whereas other nations are departing from the faith, Nigeria, you are called to be a nation of faith. Then you're going to find your peace. And when you find your peace, then you will find your progress. I pray we understand that. All right. So the Lord began to highlight the ego. He said, Nigeria has demonstrated all the other things. You, My God, this nation is rich in mineral resources. So your soil is rich. You know that already. It's the black most most populous black nation it's already there you have the river it's already there you have the strength of the stallion the strength of the horses is already there but then the lord said where is the eagle i was like oh what are you talking about he said where is the eagle the eagle is part of your destiny the eagle is part of your future the eagle is part of your identity the eagle is part of the vision that the lord has called you to him to, to to run with so the lord will say to you nigeria it's time to mount up with wings like eagles but then i began to ask why is the eagle red i do not know of any natural biological red eagle don't forget coat of arms tells stories so the story of red is blood talks about blood, talks about bloodshed. So any nation that's gone to war, any nation that's seen bloodshed, there's always red on their emblems, either on their flag or you know some of their national emblems. So they chose to make the eagle red. I don't know why they did that, but the Holy Spirit began to tell me that is the next dimension that Nigeria, God is calling Nigeria to. It's bloodied right now because your past is indeed bloody. Don't forget what you call the civil war. It wasn't really a war, it was a genocide. Right, but there's been a lot of a lot of a lot of killings. In fact, in the last few years, I would say going back 10 years or more, oh my God, Nigeria, you've seen a lot of blood spill, a lot of kidnapping, a lot of beheading of people, a lot of ritual killings. There's been a lot of bloodshed in that nation. And so the eagle is bloodied. The eagle is soaked in blood. But can I tell you something about eagles? The Bible said that they that wait upon the Lord, and I'm going to come to that, they shall renew their strength like eagle. What does it mean to renew their strength? The eagle can actually tear off its feathers, pluck off its feathers, crack its beaks, crack its claws, and grow new ones. There is that in new Nigeria. There is the nature of the eagle. There is the strength of the eagle, but there's also the soaring dimensions of the eagle. And that is what God is calling Nigeria into. I pray this prophetic word resonates in the hearts of people, especially the leaders. You've not seen anything yet. You've demonstrated the strength of the stallion, but you've not seen the strength of the eagle. You've demonstrated the strength of the stallion, but you've not seen the vision of an eagle. You've demonstrated the strength and the richness of your soil. All of that you've, uh, you've harvested but you've not yet harvested the dynamic nature of the eagle. Nigeria, there is much more for you to accomplish because there is that nature of the eagle in you. What would the Lord say to you? It's time for that eagle to come out of slumber. It's time for that eagle to come out of hibernation. It's time for that eagle to begin to wait on the Lord so that you can renew your strength. Because when this bloodied feather is all gone and you grow your new feathers, my God, this eagle is going to soar. This eagle is going to go to greater heights and even the nations of the earth will marvel at it. And so I, I'm not going to take my time on this. I began to look for red eagle and it only goes to one, one source. You won't find too much information on that. It was the order of the red eagle by, you know, it, it's, it had to do with, with uh, uh, the shivari of the kingdom of Prussia. Oh my God, I was like, whoa, now we're talking Bible terms. The kingdom of Prussia and this eagle, they designed what they called the order of the red eagle. But watch this, it was given to military personnel and civilians 
to recognize valor in combat. So there's a struggle. And Nigeria will prophesy you will overcome, you will win, you will come out tops, and the Lord is calling you to that dimension of the eagle. I got to move forward. So here is the prophetic word to Nigeria based on that, and is embedded in Isaiah 40. When I saw this, I said, oh, my Lord. This is a text we've read, we've known, we've quoted. In fact, the last verse, that's the key one. Everyone knows it. Everyone who knows Isaiah 40 knows it. But Actually, in this biblical uh, chapter, I see the story of Nigeria. I'm going to read it, read the whole thing. But I'm not just reading, I'm prophesying it. I'm declaring it into the atmosphere. It begins with say, comfort. Yes, comfort my people. Nigeria, God will say to you, comfort. May comfort be your portion in the name of Jesus. That is what your God is saying to you. Verse 2, he says, speak comfort to Jerusalem. I say to Nigeria, I speak comfort to you by the word of the Lord. But he also said, cry to her that her warfare is ended. I say to you, your warfare is coming to an end, Nigeria. Your battles, your struggles, your, your predicaments, it's coming to an end by the word of the Lord. Why? Because your iniquity is pardoned. There is much iniquity, no doubt. We cannot shy away from that. But the Lord is saying your iniquity is pardoned. Why? Because you have received from the Lord's hand double for your sins. If there's a nation that has gone through terrible things, it is Nigeria. Somebody once said, no other nation has endured what Nigerians have endured, or else they would have gone to war again. But you have endured so much. Verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, crying from the seat right now, prepare the way of the Lord. That is the word of the Lord to you, Nigeria. So again, ministers of God, young ministers of God, don't shy away from the prayers. The prayer is your your prophetic advantage. The prayers is your advantage over the nations. I know you want to be like China. I know you want to be like America, but your prayers will put you at an advantage that these other nations do not have. He said, make uh, the voice of one crying in the witness, prepare the way of the Lord, Nigeria. Prepare all you who know how to pray, you saints of God, prepare the way of the Lord in Nigeria. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Have you made a highway for God? I know you want good governance. I know you want change, but have you prepared a highway for the Lord? Where is the highway you have made for the Lord to come into your situation, to come into your nation? Because he is the only one who can truly save this nation right now. Verse four, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill will be brought low. Can't go into details. Those who are exalting themselves, acting like they are gods, acting like they are untouchables, acting like they are unstoppable. God says they will be brought low. They will be brought low. Crooked places shall be made straight. If there's any crooked nation on the earth, Nigeria, I think is number two. There's one that is number one, but you're number two. The crookedness will be made straight. The corruption will be gone. The 419 will be gone. The Lord is calling for these things to be straightened. You cannot be so corrupt and be expecting God to come and fight on your behalf. The foundation of the Lord is upon righteousness justice, mercy, and truth. You cannot deny these things and expect that things are going to go well. Deal with these things. The Lord will say to you, let crooked place be made straight. Let rough places become smooth. Verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. That's when the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. When the crooked places have been straightened, when there's accountability in office, when corruption is wiped out, when your ritual killers are brought to justice, when your kidnappers are brought to justice, when your massive corruption and 419 is dealt with, the Lord said his glory shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Verse six, then the voice began to say, cry out. And then another voice said, oh, what shall I cry? And I said, Lord, what is that? He said, yeah, Nigeria has tried everything. And I can't go into the details for time's sake. But I remember growing up, we tried so many things. In the days of uh, President Obasanjo, Operation Feed the Nation. In the days of uh, 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 Badamasi Babangida, oh my God. All kinds of things, all kinds of programs came up. You know, MAMSA, all kinds of programs. Nigeria has tried, we have the bright brains. We've tried the American system. We've tried British system. We've tried South African system. We've tried all kinds of governmental systems. So this, this voice is saying, what am I going to cry? What, did, what else is there to cry? <laughs> what else is there to say? It has been done. We've tried it all. But the Lord will say to you, all flesh is grass. Please take note of that. All flesh is grass. The grass, the, the flesh of the high and the lofty, the flesh of the low. 
the flesh of the billionaires, the flesh of the, those who don't have any money, the flesh of the educated, the flesh of the non-educated, the flesh of those who say it's their turn and they are unstoppable, and the flesh of those who are appealing for people to make common sense judgment. All flesh is as grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. It is the breath of the Lord. When the Lord takes that breath, you are gone, sir. You are not a God, you are a man. By the way, think about it. I just showed you ancient pictures of the founding fathers of our independence, but they are all dead and gone. And very soon you're gonna answer the call of death yourself. And everyone who is vying for office right now, at some point your time will be gone. So stop acting like you're a God. Stop acting like you are unstoppable. Stop acting like you're invincible. Just because Satan promised you stuff, the Lord will say to you, all flesh is grass. And they wither when the Lord withdraws his breath. Verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Nigeria, I come to prophesy to you, the word of the Lord over your life will stand. And that's why I want to say to you, don't kill yourself over 2023 election. Do the right thing. Vote your conscience and let things play out. Let God's hand move. Let God or they do what he wants to do best. But 2023 will come and will go. All the candidates will come and will go, but Nigeria will continue to be because there's a prophetic destiny upon that nation. Verse 9, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, O Nigeria, you who bring good tidings, out of you have come ministers. Get up into the high mountains. You pray on waters. Get up to your high mountains. Doesn't mean you have to go to a physical mountain. Come to the ascended place. Come to the elevated place. O Jerusalem, you will bring good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. This is not a time to be silent. This is not a time for the church to be silent. They might say, oh, church, you have no business in politics. That's right. But you are called to governance, for the government shall be upon his shoulder. Church, you have a responsibility to bring governance. And the Lord will say to you, don't hold back your voice. Lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Nigeria, say to the north, say to the east, say to the west, say to the south, say to the federal capital territory, behold your God. But stand behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and that is our prayer. The Lord, you will come with your strong hand and your arm shall rule for you. Behold, his reward is with him and his work is before him. He will feed his flock, all you flock of the Lord. Stay under the covering of the presence of the Lord. Stay under the shadow of his wings. Don't do like they do. Stay under the shadow of his wings. Let the Lord feed you. It doesn't matter who becomes president. And by the way, church, please understand, you cannot relegate your responsibility, your duty to political offices or to political parties. The Lord has called the church to be the light and the salt. Be the salt and the light of Nigeria. Lead the nation into governance, into what it means to be a nation that reverences God. Don't adjudicate your, your responsibility to a political position. All right? So the Lord will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather his lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. This is the Lord's commitment to all those who trust him. This is the Lord's commitment to those who put their trust in him. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? All right, God is challenging the gods of the land now. Who has measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Who has weighed the mountains in a scale and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did the Lord take counsel and who instructed him and taught him the path of justice? Who taught the Lord knowledge? Who showed the Lord the way of understanding? So please don't say, why was I born in Nigeria? Why was I born in Nigeria? The Lord's wisdom is superseding of any other wisdom. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as a small dust on the scales, right? He lifts up the eyes as a very little thing. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its bees sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before the Lord are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and what less. To whom then will you liken the Lord? You will thump your chest and say you are unstoppable. Are you like God? Can you stand before God? What likeness will you compare to the Lord? 
The workman molds an image. I see the image you're putting on your cap and all the signs you're doing all over the place. The workman molds an image. The goldsmith overspreads it with gold. The silver smith casts silver of chains. Whoever, those who can do that, who are impoverished to do that, they begin to contribute, you know, begin to make their own contribution. They choose a tree, a tree that they hope will not rot. Then they look for a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that they hope will not totter. But then the Lord will ask you, have you not known, O oh idol worshiper? Have you not known, O oh man of the sea? Have you not known you who have made a covenant with the gods of the land? Have you not known who you who engage in ritual killings and human sacrifices? Have you not known you who have gone into the oceans to the queen of the coast, the queen of heaven, to Asorok and acquire powers from all the gods of the land? And they promised you the office. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning, even from the beginning of the nation? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth, even the foundation of this nation? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, the Lord God himself, Yahweh, the almighty God, and looks down upon the inhabitants of the earth like grasshoppers. He is the one who stretches out the heaven like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He is the one, listen to this, listen to this, Nigeria. He is the one who brings the princes to nothing. He is the one who makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth. They will be forgotten in time. When the Lord blows on them, they will wither. And the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. Don't fight this fight, Nigerians. Young people don't die before your time. There is greatness awaiting you. The ego dimension. Don't die for this. I'm going to talk about something else when I get to that. Don't die for this. Let the Lord fight this battle. Verse 25, to whom then will you liken the Lord? Or to whom shall you, shall you say he's equal? Says the Holy One. But rather lift up your eyes on high, Nigeria. Lift up your eyes on high and see the one who has created these things. The one who brought you together. The one who formed you together. The one who made you with the nation that you are today. The one who has given you a place among the league of nations. He's the one who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. And not one is missing. So Nigeria and Nigerians, why do you say like Jacob? And why do you say like Israel? Oh, my way is hidden from the Lord. God doesn't see me. God has forsaken me. God forsaken nation. Nigeria will never be better. You say these things. The Lord said, why do you do, why do you say that? My just claim is passed over by God. Answers. All the cry we cry. Nobody cares. Nobody is watching. Nobody is listening. God said, don't say that. Why do you say that? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God. And here is your prophetic word, Nigeria. The everlasting God. The Lord. The creator of the ends of the earth neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. Receive the power of the Lord, O Nigeria. Even to you who is weak, even to you who says my vote cannot is not counted, even to you who says it doesn't matter, receive the strength of the Lord. And to those who have no might, may the Lord increase your strength. Even the youth shall faint. So youth, don't depend on your physical strength. Don't depend on the strength of your youth because that will fail. It will faint and grow weary and you will fall if you go by that strength. Or rather those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength like the eagle. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. That's the dimension God is calling you, Nigeria. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. May the Lord bless his word in the name of Jesus. Quickly, here is the apostolic counsel I want to give before we go into prayer. Youths of Nigeria, it's your time. Establish, it's your time. There's an agitation. There's an agitation. There's a cry of the masses for the old to give way and for the new to come into, into positions of leadership. But the old is holding on. So it's, that is clear. Now, I'm not saying which, is, which should be or which, which, which is better. That's not the point. My point is that's the time you're in right now, all right? As a matter of fact, the frontliners of your presidential candidates 
those who are the frontliners in your presidential candidates actually present a prophetic picture. Watch this. One of them represents the ancient powers that have held sway for centuries. You're dealing with something that has been for centuries. If you go back to the ancient tr the tribes and their stories, you know what I'm talking about. The Yoruba land, you know what I'm talking about. The Ogun and the Oshuns and, and, and Odishas and all of that stuff. You know what I'm talking about. So you're dealing with ancient principalities here. And one of your candidates represents that. It's obvious, you know that, right? And, but how do you know? The godlike posture, the imposition of self upon the people, the pompous words, like the, 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 the lamb that spoke like a dragon, spoke pompous words in the book of Revelation, have no concern to even insult the president of the land because he is coming from a higher place. He's coming from a place where he feels he's invincible. No mortal man can touch him. No mortal man can do anything to him because he's backed by the gods of the land. One represents this ancient principalities. And so he's acting like he's unstoppable. The other one represents, watch this, the height of human endeavor with all its flaws, the ways of man, the greed, the control, the covetousness, the, the alternative agenda, the, 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 the superior posture of one tribe over another. Everything that, that is man-made, strength of man, one of them represents that. And then the other one represents the aspirations of a new generation that has come of age. This generation was told, shut up, say nothing. You don't know nothing. You don't know what to do. But that generation is coming of age. They say, oh, go and vote, go and vote. We're not going to give you the power. You come and take it. You know, go to the polls. Well, that generation is coming of age. And one of them represents that generation. All right? That generation is trying to break away from the ancient powers and trying to break away from the failed practices of the past. Now, I'm not saying that generation is perfect. No, you're not. You're really not. But as imperfect as it is, it is crying out for self-awareness. It is crying out for self-governance. It is crying out for the yoke to be broken off their necks, for the imposition to stop. It is crying out because they believe there are better ways to do things. Observe, in that same one who represents this generation that has come of age, you find for the first time in Nigeria's history, a candidate who is not older than the nation itself. For the first time, you have a candidate who was born after the nation's independence. The Lord showed me this a few years ago, that those who were born before the nation's independence have their identities rooted in their tribes, not in the nation. The Lord spoke this to me years back. Those who were born before the nation got its independence already established their identity in their tribes. So they are tribalistic. They push their tribal agenda. They don't have the DNA of the Nigerian state, the DNA of the Nigerian nation within their blood veins. But for the first time, Nigeria, you have a candidate who was born after independence. So he is the representation of the true Nigerian candidate. He is the one who is a true Nigerian. The others are really not Nigerians. They are their tribes. But this one is a Nigerian. Again, I'm not saying better or not better. I'm just statement of facts, okay? So unlike those whose identity derives from their tribes, this other one, his identity is that he was born into Nigeria, all right? But this is going to be a fight. And again, when I say fight, I'm not talking about picking sticks. You can't bring sticks to a gunfight. All right? You can't bring physical strength and aggression to a spiritual warfare. Please, young ones, hear the word of the Lord. This is going to be a spiritual battle. It's a fight between spiritual powers. Three things at war here. The spiritual powers, ancient principalities, human schemes, and human manipulations and orchestrations and machinations but also the agitation of the masses. So those three forces are coming to head here. The spiritual powers are trying to hold their place. Humans are doing their own thing, all right? But then there's a cry of the, of the masses that is agitating for change. And by the way, you can't rule any of the three out. Don't, because think about it. All three of the frontliners have millions of Nigerians following them. Think about that. So you see got work to do. 
All right. If millions can still be going with this candidate, or it shows you you still have work to do in Nigeria. If millions are still going with this other candidate, it shows you there's work to do. And if millions are following this other candidate, it shows you that there's work to be done also. So not everybody sees what you see. Not everybody agrees with you. Why is that? Are they not feeling the pain? Are they not feeling the agitation? Why can't they make the change? Why do they prefer change, chicken change, over their future, over the future of their children? Why do they do that? It means that the powers have not been broken off yet. And so you can't win this thing just by the polls or in the ballots. It's a spiritual warfare that must be done. It must, it's a grassroots transformation and education that must be done. And don't go back and sit down and wait till the next four years election. Start now, assuming God doesn't give you what you're looking for right now. Because I'm not yet to make predictions, but I'm speaking what the Lord will want, want me to speak. But also, Nigeria, there are prophetic insights that this battle will go beyond the polls. Some people have already said that. So it's going to be a long haul. So get ready for a long night. Get ready for a long wait. Don't think, oh, you vote and then it's done. Some people have already seen this thing will go beyond the polls. So get ready. Wait for it. Wait for it. Tighten your belt. Get ready. It's a long haul. But again, not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. Young people, I say to you again, please do not die. Please do not die in this war. Don't engage in physical warfare. Don't engage in aggression. Don't even engage in like you did in NSAS. That's not even a call for it right now. You can do peaceful protests under well-organized protests coming under notable names. But please don't go off the tangent. And I tell you why. Here's what the Lord will say to you. This fight is beyond physical aggression and strength. Your cry to the Lord of hosts in sincerity will actually be a greater weapon than your physical fight or your physical might because it's a spiritual war. Here's what's going on. These ancient principalities are old and frail. You can see it already. I don't have to explain that. They are frail. They are old. They are losing their ground. And many people have seen this vision. They are getting ready to break. In fact, it looks like if you touch them, they will just die. They can't even stand. They can't hold the flag. They can't stand on their own. They need support. They need support. Please hear this, Nigeria. They need support. They are feeble. They are old. They're getting ready to die. But they want young blood. So if you go and die in this battle, you will be supplying them with the fresh blood that they are looking for that will revive them. That's what the Lord will have, have me say to you. So young people, do not die on the altar of sacrifice. So again, oh yeah, I'm glad I have it here. The ancient powers are old, they are frail, and they are about to die. But they are looking for fresh blood. Fresh blood that will empower them to go on for some more. Don't be that blood, young people. Young people do not die on the altars of their sacrifice. They've set their altars. They are hoping that there will be something to cause bloodshed so that your blood will become what they use in their ritual sacrifices to empower themselves and to go on for some time more. Don't fall for it, young people. Don't fall for it, young people. Rather, let due process reign. You're going to find some legal champions will rise up. May I take you back to the original founders of the independence? They were experts at law. They understood the British. They engaged the British at their level of intelligence. You can't use physical battle in something that requires intelligence, that requires smartness. Engage. Learn the history. Learn the laws of the land. Learn the constitution. That is how you wage this war. Not your physical cry. Not your physical destruction or violence. Not your area boy style. No. Smart people. Look for them amongst you who can represent you in the court of law. Legal processes must be allowed to have its way. And here is a biblical template as I'm beginning to round it up. There's a biblical template for you. The nation Israel came under a worse condition that you are in right now, Nigeria. It was the era of Jezebel. It was the era of Jezebel. I can't tell the whole story, but Jezebel was a foreigner. Don't forget that. Jezebel was not even from Israel, but she came with her gods. Her father, Ethbel, was the high priest of a terrible god, terrible demonic spirit, mighty worshiper of demons, right? So her do his daughter became the force, the principality over Israel, and Israel could not shake her off. But watch this, Nigeria. Watch this, people of God. Elijah, the prophet of God, 
went against Jezebel in physical aggression. In physical aggression, Elijah did not go back to the Lord to ask, how do you want us to engage Jezebel? Elijah came mighty, mighty man of valor, killed Jezebel's prophets. Oh my Lord. We don't see what the Lord told, her to, told him to do that. Killed Jezebel's prophets. About 450 or probably 850 in one day. But, but following that, there was a dramatic turn of events. It was Elijah who ran for his life in the end. Wait a minute, where's your strength? Where's your aggression? What happened to it? Elijah fled for his life. Prophet of God, but that did not stop the matter. Prophet of God, that did not defeat Jezebel because he did not go by the counsel of the Lord. So I'm saying to you, don't go that way. Do you know what the Lord did? The Lord now told Elijah, anoint Elisha to take your place. Oh my God, take your time and go and read the story of Elisha. Elisha representing a younger generation of prophets. And my God, Nigeria, you have a lot of young generation, younger generation of prophets. I'm not going to mention names. They're all over the place. So God is asking some to leave their countries and come to Nigeria because he's getting ready to do something in Nigeria. So don't say God is not doing something. And they are seeing visions and they are prophesying to you. They are raising up an army all over the place. Look to them, young people. They have the word for your future. Elisha came up with a mighty strategy. Do you know it took Elisha about 10 years before he dethroned Jezebel? 10 years. What did Elisha do? He didn't go like his father, uh, Elijah. Elisha followed the word of the Lord, began to recruit an army of God from all sides, recruited a military man by the name of Jehu, sent one of his prophets to anoint Jehu. So Jehu was ready. Got eunuchs ready. Eunuchs were the priests, pastors, ministers of God. They too were ready. Then he got the Shunammite woman, business people. Business people were ready. Then he had the school of the prophets, raising up a generation of leaders who were the voice of the nation, prophetic people. Oh, and don't forget, he also anointed King Hazael that Elijah did not anoint. And who is King Hazael? Governors, presidents, leaders of the world, global leaders. All of them came together in their secret places, but connected, all fighting one purpose. And at the, on the right day, the D-Day, all of them, it took all of these things to bring the Jezebelic structure down. You want to bring down this principality, all of you must come together. All of this must come together. Your business people, your politicians, and I'm talking about young people. The young people, not the old guy, the young people. You're going to bring everybody, your legal minds, the professionals, business people, motivational speakers, the prophets. Don't cut off the, the church. Don't cut off the mosque they, because God has planted in all of these places people who he has raised up for your future. That is what it would take to completely bring the structure down. And with that, we're going to pray. And my prayer for Nigeria is coming from the book of Daniel, chapter 9, from verse 1 to 19. This was Daniel praying after he saw the vision about his own nation, Nigeria. I mean, his own nation, uh, Israel. And so I'm praying with using his own words. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. On this 22nd day of February, for many of you, it's already the 23rd day, uh, Thursday, in the year 2023, according to the Gregorian calendar, we, the King's Court, a section of the body of Christ, along with all who have joined us, on all who are joining us on Facebook, on Zoom, who will see it on YouTube, and those who will see it in the days to come. We join, oh God, having received spiritual insight regarding the nation of Nigeria. Your servant being a native of Nigeria, myself, we come together in this virtual prayer service to set our faces toward you, oh Yahweh, oh Lord God, to make our requests by prayer and supplications in humility. We pray to you, O oh Lord, our God, and make our confession on behalf of Nigeria. You are the great and awesome God. You keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and with those who keep your commandments. On behalf of Nigeria, collectively as a people and as a nation, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by walking away from your precepts and from your judgments. We have not sought for, 
shown much interest in, nor have we heeded your genuine servants and ministers who truly spoke in your name to our forebears and our leaders at the local, the state, and the federal levels. Oh Lord, you are righteous, always righteous. You are not to be blamed for Nigeria's predicament. You are not to be blamed for the present condition of this nation. It is humans who walk away from your precepts. And so shame and reproach become the outcomes. But the nation and its leaders and its fathers acknowledge on this day the undesirable condition of the nation. We all see it. We all know there is greatness in this nation. We all know it can be better. We all wonder why are we still backward when we have all it takes to become a great nation in the earth. We see it, Lord. We acknowledge it. To you, Lord, belong mercy and forgiveness despite the nation's rebellion. In spite of the nation's disobedience and deliberate departure from every known ordinance of righteousness and unrighteousness, we even celebrate corruption, oh God. Yes, the nation as a whole has transgressed your law and has departed from your path, both the nation and even the church, even from the very inception, or should we say the contraption of the nation, and today, Lord, we are reaping the fruits and harvest of decades of rebellion, decades of rebellion, decades of alternative agenda to national development, decades of nepotism, decades of tribalism, decades of maladministration, decades of greed, decades of covetousness, decades of power by any means, including ritual killings and human sacrifice. Oh, Lord, decades of betrayal, send people to office, they do something else. Decades of betrayal of the tribes, one to another. Decades of murders and even genocides. Yet, Lord, we have not turned to you as a nation to seek national healing and to understand the truth that brings freedom. Instead, we have put our trust in fellow humans and political parties that fail again and again. And so, Lord, our wounds and putrefying sores have not been healed, have not been medicated, and have not been attended to. Oh, Lord God of our biblical fathers, you do mighty things. You do mighty things, oh God. Let your displeasure be turned away from our nation, Nigeria, as it is called. Complex as it is, it is the land that has become home to some of your people. Out of this land, oh God, remember, call to remembrance, oh God, that out of this land, you have indeed raised up men and women of great faith in Yahweh, who have traversed the earth, and you are still raising some who have traversed the earth, no names across the world you have raised up from this nation, who have declared your goodness and your power. Oh Lord, our God, remove our reproach as a nation remove our reproach as a people so that we are no longer a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our Lord and our God, let our prayers ascend to you as sweet incense. Oh, Lord, our God, incline your ear to hear our pleas. May your eyes look upon us in your great mercy because of our desolations. Our petition and our supplication is certainly not deserved. We don't deserve it. We couldn't have turned away from you and then expecting one twinkle of an eye for Eldorado to happen. No, it's not deserved. But Lord, we call to you, we cry out to you because of your great mercies. Because of your great mercies, Lord. So Lord God, may we have your attention and a favorable hearing in the court of heaven. Forgive, Lord. Hearken, Lord. Act on our behalf speedily, oh God, in line with your divine intent. We are nobody to impose anything on you. We have no right to tell you what to do. But we say, God, act on our behalf in line with your divine intent. And act, Lord, before the people make another grave error in judgment. And before children of Belial have their way and impose upon us again for your name and for your glory. 
Lord, let the four winds of heaven blow upon Nigeria, according to Daniel chapter 7, verse 2 and 3. Stir up, O God, the great sea of the peoples of Nigeria. Let there be a changing of the gods in line with your divine intent. Let the wind of change cause the rise of visionary, patriotic, and godly leaders upon the mountains of leadership. And we prophesy to the mountains of Nigeria, according to Ezekiel 36, 8 to 15, all mountains of Nigeria shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to God's people in the land. Let righteous, patriotic, and visionary leaders be multiplied upon you, O mountains of Nigeria, and may they take possession of your high places. For the glory of the Lord God, Yahweh, for the glory of the Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, and for the joy of his people and all people of goodwill. Amen and amen and amen and amen. I want to thank you all so much for your time. Until we come your way again shortly, stay elevated. We love you. God bless you. Nigeria, you will rise to greatness and may the eagle dimension of the call of God upon your life come upon you and may you fulfill destiny in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye-bye now.